Okay. Hi, all. This is uh, Roger Horowitz of the uh, Hadley Center for the History of Business Technology and Society with another episode of Hadley Does History. This is our, our bi-monthly podcast in which we showcase interesting works and innovative works that highlight the kinds of materials we have here at Hagley and the kind of subjects with which we engage. This is a special edition of our Hagley History Hangout because we're celebrating the book that won the Hagley Prize for the best book in, history, in business history. It's a prize that's awarded jointly between the Hagley Library and the Business History Conference. It's a big deal. We get, we get lots of books submitted for it and we have our winner book there, Underwriters of the United States and the author, Hannah Farber, will be talking with us about, about the book. Uh, Hannah uh, has a PhD from uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. She's currently an assistant professor uh, of history at Columbia University. I'm sure we'll see associate in front of her name before too long with the quality of her work. And Hannah's agreed to sit with us for the next half hour, 45 minutes and tell us about the book. So Hannah, thank you for coming and sitting with us in this program. Thanks so much for having me. So let me start off with a very sort of simple question, um, which is why did you write this book? Or to put it more, more sharply, what questions, uh, what was on your mind? What issues were you, were you thinking about that led you to undertake this book, which began as a dissertation and has taken you know, a, good, a large part of your young life? So I did not start out this project looking for a topic in the history of business. I did not think of myself as a business historian. I didn't think of myself as an economic historian. I was drawn to the history of the early American Republic, which seemed like a very exciting time when when citizens of the young nation sort of went on various adventures in their country and around the world. And I was particularly drawn to um, commercial adventure in the age of the Napoleonic Wars. And I loved reading newspapers that had descriptions of all the kinds of goods that Americans were importing and exporting from around the world. And uh, I love just watching that sort of endless, the endless shopping lists of early America coming together. I, I still have never grown tired of them. Um, and so I was looking at stories of merchant ventures and all that and um, found myself sort of amused when in, in a number of merchant autobiographies and um, collections of papers and things like that, I came across these references to insurance. And at first, I just thought it was very funny because it seemed very incongruous that people would start talking about insurance in the middle of, of their adventure story. Um, and gradually, as I came to thought about I, to think about why it was that I why was insurance always there? Why didn't I expect it to be there? Um, and it, 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 as I followed those threads where insurance was leading me, I found this whole, this whole tapestry, this whole texture of American life in which insurance functions as the, the underpinning for this world of crazy commercial adventure in the age of um, uh, independence in the Napoleonic Wars. In other words, I, I sort of started seeing it as if um, the ships were <laughs> having their adventures and chases and trades and captures on, um, on the surface of the ocean. And if you sort of turned that whole world upside down and looked underneath, what you would find was the financial network of insurance underneath it all, tying everybody together. Um, and the more I looked, the more I saw, my God, there are a lot of people in insurance in the early years of the United States. How did this business get to be so big so quickly? Um, and so there's a lot of um, paperwork that survives from the 1790s, from the 1800s, when insurance corporations were founded. And so that was sort of the low hanging fruit. Um, but then when I started to try to find out how, how did all of this insurance come to seem to come into existence out of nothing so quickly. Um, that's when I started to understand an even deeper story, which is about the relationship between insurance and the, the founding of the United States, or in other words, the ways in which insurance was this business that 
existed before the United States did, and that this 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 period when it looked like insurance was becoming this big business out of nowhere was actually a story of a great resituating or a great reconciliation between a very big, very old, very organized and profitable international business that was essential to the commerce in the age of sale. I was watching that business reconcile itself to the existence of a new uh, political entity called the United States. And I was watching it, instead of watching it come out of nowhere, what I was really seeing was insurance resituating itself into the, the forms that we recognize today as forms of modern business, like the corporation. And that's what that's the story that became this book. Well, it's sort of the, the insurance that provides, if you will, the, the, the web that allows you to situate individual stories in context to each other. That's, again, the way it sounds to me. Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay. Um, I'm, most people who are watching or listening probably don't know what this world of insurance was before the American Revolution. So, so give us sort of stage one here. I mean, b- before the Revolution, tell us about this age of sale, and the role of insurance, and why it's in all these stories of trading stories and maritime travels and all that. Insurance in the age of sale. Right. So the 18th century British Atlantic is an age in which um, the British Empire is expanding, um, in which the British Empire is is financializing, um, in which there are sort of new institutions being invented that allow um, the government to borrow money from the public more effectively, um, and they use that money to wage more wars, so there's more expansion. Um, more expansion means more plantations. More plantations means more commerce. More commerce means more war, as you uh, as you <laughs> know your neighbors um, in, and their own imperial projects. So it's a century of... Um, dramatic commercial expansion for the British Empire, and it's also a period in which one's risks expand enormously alongside that opportunity. Um, So insurance, I've always said in in the 18th century, has some uneasy relationship with the business of gambling. And so one way to think of this is that um, the British, is that British commerce in the 18th century becomes a higher stakes gambling table. And in order for more and more people to um, launch their commercial ventures in this age of constant intermittent warfare and risk and opportunity, um, it becomes tremendously advantageous for them to have other means for managing that risk. So marine insurance, the insurance of ships and their goods, which is a practice that has existed in its modern form since the, the Italian city-states technically founded it in its modern form in the 18 in the in the 1400s sorry um marine insurance became a big important business in the british empire throughout this age of expansion um and there were two licensed legitimate insurance corporations in london from uh, around 1720 but corporations were not essential to the insurance business um, what was essential if you wanted to get insurance for your commercial venture was um, was essentially a broker and a group of underwriters. And so you go to your insurance broker and tell your broker what uh, sort of voyage you were planning. And you, you'd have to give a lot of information because your broker would need to be able to communicate to your underwriters what kind of risks you were planning to face. Is it hurricane season? Is a war going on? Are you engaging in some commerce that is only semi-legal, perhaps, or whose legality has not yet been determined. And that's another story of this book, is political risk as opposed to um, the risks of the oceans or of random local aggressors. But in any case, you go to the broker and the broker would assemble some underwriters for you and they would all sort of take portions of the risk of your voyage. You would tell them how much you expected to gain. They would portion up that risk at a certain insurance rate. And so a number of things happened through that process that made insurance a really important business. And one is that insurers became incredibly important information aggregators um, because they were the ones who needed to understand the risks that they were taking on. 
Insurance is this old arcane business in the 18th century already, but one of its core principles is sort of let the insurer beware. The insurer is supposed to behave as if, in a way, he's a sailor on the voyage. He's supposed to know the risk that he's taking. So most experienced influential underwriters are merchants themselves, um, or if they're not, they're sort of being a little bit reckless or they, they, they're assumed to have some sort of guidance in this process. But the people who are leading um, the insurance business have to be experienced merchants because only experienced merchants understand the huge, impossible variety of risks that people face um, when they're launching merchant voyages in the 18th century. So assuming that you are amenable to the premium rate that you um, are offered by your broker, you get an insurance policy from that broker, the underwriters have guaranteed to indemnify you in case you have a loss, whether that loss is partial or total, um, and you launch your voyage. And another aspect of this business is that um, you are not expected to pay up most of the time until your ship comes in. So the, the, this isn't a business that requires a whole lot of cash on hand. Um, it instead coasts on and reinforces the way that accounting and business mostly work in the 18th century, which is through relationships um, and people, uh, you know, exchange credits and debits through their banks, or they just use notes of hand, or they use book credits. Um, so then people are not carrying around, you know, buckets of gold in order to finalize their insurance transactions. What they have instead is very, very knowledgeable merchants and, and information experts who are constantly assessing and managing the risks that they're taking on. The last thing that I would say is crucial to understanding the way this business works in the 18th century. So like I said, it, it's very um, uh, uh, tradition bound. It's very customary. And when I say that, it sounds like I'm saying it's backwards, but that's not really what I mean. Um, what I mean is that it's sort of like if you, if you jump into a jump rope that somebody's already spinning, there are already a lot of customs and traditions and expectations in place for how your insurance policy is going to function, um, what risks are covered, what are known to be covered. One of my favorite examples of this is that most insurance policies operate under the assumption that you are not going to do anything illegal except for things that everybody knows that you're going to do, even though they're illegal. For example, going to certain ports where it's customary to bribe the port inspector. Now, that might be illegal, but if everybody does it, <laughs> your insurer is expected to cover it. But if you try to bribe port inspectors in a place where port inspectors are not expected to be bribed, then your insurance policy is potentially at risk if you get into trouble for doing that. So there's this huge body of customary knowledge. It keeps merchants constantly in contact with each other and insurers are sort of at the center of it all because they have this sort of enforcement capacity. If you violate the terms of your insurance policy, your insurer is not going to indemnify you for any losses. So some of the language that I use in the book really sees insurers uh, as sort of uh, governors of other merchants. Um, uh, the scholar Luis Lobo Guerrero calls this insurantial sovereignty. Um, and sovereignty is a really spicy and important world, word in the early modern world. Um, it's a world in which what sovereignty means is hotly debated. What does it mean to have a state? What does it mean to be a subject of a ruler? What does it mean to be part of a nation? So it's something that we should take very seriously when merchants behave and think as if their insurers are their rulers. Um, and what happens when the United States comes into being is you can start to see kinds of conflict emerge when it becomes clear that merchants do have two kinds of rulers. One, um, the rulers of their country legitimately elected, uh, the others being their fellow merchants who issued them insurance policies. Well, just to move with that concept for a bit longer, you stress the importance of, of I pronounce it correctly, Lex Mercatoria, yeah. which is uh, merchant law. Um, and that's a fascinating element of your of your book there. So explain that. Uh, and, and again, it seems to fit this, this governance role that you're right. describing, as you're it's just saying that the underwriters, the insurance world has in this in this era. Right, so, so in merchant law or Lex Mercatoria, the laws of merchants is a little bit of a politically charged topic today because it 
it sort of prefigures or shadows a modern conflict between people who think that markets are self-regulating and those who believe very firmly that they are not. So to explain this further, um, there is this early modern idea that there is this body of quote unquote law, which is a word we have to use carefully, but there's a, a sort of a law of merchants. And this law of merchants, which starts to exist in English language handbooks from the early 1600s, consists of any manner of things that in aggregate amount to what merchants generally do and how merchants generally work. So if you actually open any of these compilations of merchant law, um, you see a, a wide variety of topics like um, bills of exchange, or sometimes they throw in currency conversion rates in different countries or how different ports work. Uh, they're, they're sort of handbooks, but there's also this bit of mythology to them which is the idea that merchants all work the same way everywhere, and they have always worked in the same way since time immemorial. Now, just by saying this, I've caused a thousand historian heart attacks. We all know that's not true. Uh, merchant practice changes over time. Um, merchants do not operate independently of governments. And in fact, this, this idea that merchants operate independently of governments is put forward and, and conceptualized in a specifically political context. In other words, you don't need to say that kind of thing. We operate independently of governance. You don't, you don't need to say that unless it's suddenly become very important to clarify what role a government has in managing your business. So, uh, on the one hand, this assertion that merchants follow the laws of merchants that have been the same everywhere and, and at all times is, is obviously false. And it's politically motivated. It comes out in an age when early modern states are consolidating. They're getting stronger. However, um, here's where I would sort of add nuance to this perspective. Insurance also really is an international practice in its bones from its very origins. Um, and just to connect the dots here, insurance is always one of the central topics of compilations of the laws of merchants. Insurance is born in the world of city-states. It's born in a world where there are very high value cargoes that need to get from place to place. Merchants are trying to get these cargoes through the politically fragmented world of the Mediterranean, and they need a system that's going to allow them to manage their risks and that's going to allow them to trust each other. And there's a whole literature on merchant trust, and it's, it's really complicated, and it's really different in different places. But there is something about the way that insurance works by the time we get to the, our, our 18th century that you know, I wouldn't say it's it's independent of states, but it is used to functioning across political divides, and um, it is a business that is not surprised by any political uncertainties. And we see some evidence of this when the American Revolution breaks out, um, and the sort of jaundiced political commentators in London who are watching you know, what the ministries are doing, and they're watching the financial markets, and they're going, huh, this is a new one. What's this going to do to insurance? You know, are the American rebels, you know, warring foreigners, or are they domestic rebels, or are they pirates? And they literally say, well, this is going to be a job for the lawyers to figure out. You know, and they, they say like, the, I forget what the phrasing is, it's in the book, it's something like the mills are going to turn. Right. Um, so lawyers are going to make money, some insurers are going to make a fortune, some are going to lose a fortune. This all has to be legally navigated, right? It's not as if states are not involved, yeah. but it's also not e even this crazy thing. The American Revolution is not preventing people from going into the insurance business. It's not even preventing British subjects from wandering into Lloyd's and going, should we underwrite any Americans during this war? <laughs> and in fact, it is not illegal to um, ensure uh, your nation's enemy, even when you're at war for most of the 18th century. There are certain carve outs where you, you really are not allowed to ensure your enemy in specific circumstances. But in general, insurance is this big domestic valuable business for Britain, but it's also going to work the way it's going to work. 
And a lot of political commentators involved in insurance are like, well, you know, the government could put stricter rules on insurance, but if they do that, they're going to kill the goose that, that lays the golden egg. Why shouldn't British underwriters insure friendships? You know, if they get captured, we'll we'll make money. Um, and that's that's money that's coming home to Britain. So this insurance conflict really you know, it, it seems funny and it seems sort of grasping and small and you might think, you know, merchants are just, you know, out for a buck and, and all that is true. But it also, um, the insurance conversation in the 18th century opens this giant um, can of worms about what what is, what does it mean to act in the national interest and to what degree in a, a globalized, financialized world, um, what makes you a patriot? what makes you patriotic and what makes you disloyal? So if you are insuring the nation's enemies, but you are profiting at home, you know, should you be allowed to do that or not? And this is a question that, you know, I think we can say clearly has never actually been fully resolved. I mean, this is partly because you have continued commercial relationships that have to continue and you need to have, you know, we, we talked about this, you need to have rules, you know, to engage in certain kinds of, you know, economic practices. So, you know, that, you, you can get paid or your goods will be delivered and sold and all that. So uh, it's hard. And so you have this, so you have one hand, you have this long tradition, which I think you've outlined. And then you have the rise of the nation state, which is mm -hmm. very much a, a, a 18, 19th century phenomenon there. American Revolution, of course, ushers uh, in the mm -hmm. era of democracy. We'll get to the French Revolution in a minute. So, so tell us about the American Revolution. I mean, you want to make the claim that, that this insurance underwriting helps to create the United States in the revolutionary era. Uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, how does this happen? You take this world out there, long traditions, these crazy folks in Boston and other places say, no, no, we're going we're, we're, we're to say goodbye to the British Empire. Uh, world is turned upside down. Mm -hmm. How does the insurance underwriting play into that process? So one of the things that happens during the 18th century is that there start to be insurance brokerages on in in anglo north america in the port cities they're not really that big um it, it's not a huge business until i i find through my research until the, the seven years war when especially in philadelphia um when you have a lot of economic activity military activity um uncertainty of of trade trade interrupted by french enemies you start to see some significant amount of brokerage action uh, in philadelphia boston you know places that you would expect on the north american continent i don't find these brokerages to be particularly politicized in any way um, port city merchants go about their business, which is generally doing things that support the empire, but also engaging in the kind of smuggling, you know, the famously you know, smuggling sugar and molasses from the West Indies, and they openly get insurance on this kind of smuggled French West Indian sugar and molasses, because it's, it's merchants underwriting merchants, it's these small communities spreading their risks. So these brokerages exist um, when the American Revolution begins, and even though the American Revolution presents a great deal of hazard for American merchant commerce, um, that doesn't make people run away from the insurance business. Because again, what you have is a bunch of port city merchants. They still need stuff. Everybody in the country needs imported stuff. They need to export as well. So the risks are higher. So they're grasping for all these mechanisms that are going to reduce their risks in trade. Um, and suddenly it is a lot more advantageous for these communities to uh, self-insure effectively rather than try to get their insurance from London and, and, and convince some London underwriters and brokers that they're you know that their business is is that <laughs> that if there's a loss that London underwriters should pay out to American rebels, right? It's just a bit more uncertain how that's going to work. Though I would argue it continues through the revolution, and it's not impossible. But anyway, so you have increasing number of brokerages, more business during the American Revolution, and uh, what I argue in the book is that insurance isn't just defense for Americans at this point, once the war started, it's also offense. Um, and what I mean by that is that 
a lot of merchants fit out their ships with guns to become privateers. There's almost no American Navy. So um, to the extent that there is a public-private divide in this era, uh, the initiatives coming from the private side, right? Port city merchants are fitting out their ships with guns. Some are being taken over by the, the Continental Navy, uh, and some people are fitting out ships to go on privateer voyages, try to attack the British, steal British ships, and cause general mayhem on behalf of the American cause, hoping to get some money in return. Now, privateering against British merchant vessels is a high-risk, high-reward activity, so merchants who are involved in this are very busy sometimes underwriting each other, um, and they share, it's just one of their ways that they can share risk. So, for example, you know, you could you could take a, a piece of a voyage, a, voyage, a privateering voyage could be collectively owned, and that would be one way to reduce the risk. Um, another way would have it be underwritten. So, I've seen insurance rates of like 50, 75 percent on some of these privateering voyages. And then it effectively makes the underwriters, you know, I, I, I'm loose with economic terminology here because I don't think strict terminology is appropriate for this world and time. Um, but they're sort of co-investors in these voyages. They take on so much of the, the risk. Um, so that's insurance as offense, privateers with insurance policies. Um, insurance is also offense in the sense that you know, we know that the rebelling Americans are not going to invade Britain and take it over and win the war that way, right? They're going to win independence when Britain gives up fighting them and decides that it's not worth the trouble to continue, which is, of course, what eventually right. does happen with the war. Um, but what are the ways in which Americans can make the war seem unpopular, useless, politically embarrassing to the British. Well, one way they can do that is by capturing British merchant ships. Again, they don't have much of a Navy, so a lot of the initiative is on this private side here. Um, how do they know that they're making a difference? By How do they know they've captured enough British merchant ships? They're not going to get all of them. They're not even going to get most or half of the British merchant ships that are out there. But how do they know they're embarrassing the British and causing them trouble? if insurance rates on British commercial vessels go up. So American newspapers are reporting very proudly that they have caused, um, that, that you know, John Paul Jones's captures or whatever, have caused the insurance rates for British merchants to spike at Lloyd's of London. And these are headlines in British papers. Yeah, there's plenty of British opponents to the war. They want the ministry to look bad. They're happy to hear that too. And Americans especially will reprint that and be like, yeah, British insurance rates have gone up. That's how, you know, that's how, you know, that's a, that's a good thing for American morale. And that's one of those kinds of stories that I thought was just kind of funny when I started researching. But what it actually shows you is how, quote unquote, economic um, phenomena um, are are influential or, or important in, in political affairs during this period of the war. That's usually narrated, at least on the American side, as a, a matter of patriotism. Well, just so I interject for a second, it also tells you how aware the public is about insurance, that it's not something which, you know, in a way we have it today where it's sort of seen but not, not heard, where this is news that, that insurance rates have spiked because they are aware of the location of insurance in the political economies uh, of the time. Yeah, and that's another interesting thing that I follow about insurance in this book is, is this question of how politically visible insurance really is. Because at some times and in some ways, like these headlines, insurance seems extremely visible. And once there start to be insurance companies incorporated in American port cities, they're extremely prominent in port city newspapers. They're always um, electing new directors. They're issuing these big dividends that get people's attention. Um, but on the other hand, the public doesn't really understand what insurers do, or and they don't understand the scope of the insurance sector, really. And in that way, insurance never really politically codes in the same way that banks do. You know, banks are just this endless political football in 19th century United States. You know, banking is this hot mess for the century. People are mad all the time. It's really chaotic. Things are changing all the time. And everybody sort of knows how to fight about banks. People don't really know what to say about insurance companies. And part of that is that they are 
well, they're, they're real businesses. I mean, we can be suspicious of the political motivations of their founders, certainly, but they are real financial infrastructure. They are um, engaged in this really complicated calculative work to spread the risks of, of um, merchant commerce, which everybody in the country knows is important. And so this sort of tacking back and forth between visibility and and invisibility, I argue, is, is both really characteristic of the early American insurance sector, and it also provides the American insurance sector some significant advantages. It allows them to take on a couple of different personas um, in political affairs, depending on what um, suits them best. So one um, dichotomy that I talk about a few times in the book is that um, insurance companies, the insurance sector likes to have it both ways. They like to be American civic entities when they want to, and they want to be private, invisible tools of the merchants when they want to. So when things are going well for insurers, and in some ways they go really well for most of the Napoleonic Wars, when American commerce is dangerous but also crucial, um, it's a high risk, high reward environment that insurance companies really profit in. And insurance companies tend not to want to be regulated or looked at too closely when things are going well for them. They say, you know, we're just these private vessels of mercantile money and affairs. We only govern merchants. Merchants are doing their own thing to the benefit of the country. You know, stay out of our business. We assess our own risks and we are we control merchants in a way that keeps them from getting too out of hand with the risks that they take. We're doing what's best for the country. We're cal we're, we, we make objectives objective calculations. We're not really involved in politics. Leave us alone. Now, <laughs> when the world of trade gets too dangerous for insurers' comfort, then they change their tune. Then they make public appeals that essentially establish them as, as publicly important, civically <laughs> virtuous entities that are deeply embedded in the fabric of the United States. And for that reason, they deserve additional government support. So, for example, um, when the French and British are, are both preying on American ships in the first decade of the 19th century, um, the insurers are interested in having the government build more warships to protect the American merchant fleet. Now, that reduces their risk, which means more money in their pockets. It's highly self-interested. Now, that doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it is very self-interested. But their pleas then are like, oh, please, you know, we're American money. We're run by American citizens. Um, they're, they're trying to establish the new U.S. government as their own insurer of last resort, I think we would say in contemporary language. So when things are going well for them, they want to say our risks are our own, our profits are our, our own, because they're making more profits. When their um, losses are exceeding their profits, they try to cast the United States as their own underwriter. Well, that speaks to a point you stress throughout this book there is the role, if you will, the public role of these private agencies mm -hmm. in governance. And this is for people who care about the literature. This is a huge literature about the extent to which there is actually an American state in the early years. Of the mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a weak state. It's, it's, it's all these back and forth. We don't have to re, you know, go back through there. Um, but what you want to say, as I understand it, is that in addition to all this conversation about the true powers of the state, and state governments and the municipalities and all that, there's also this private governance role that is being played in this area. Can you explain that? Especially, especially thinking in the early republic, post-constitution, uh, early 19th century. What do you mean by that? The, the role and sort of constitutive element in creating a state? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think my approach to this topic comes from a lot of reading in early modern European history, um, which like in, I, I describe myself in my Twitter handle as a late, late early modernist. Um, and one of the things that I mean by that in this book is I want us to try to squint and see even the first decades of the 19th century in the United States as a time period in which we can't take for granted what public and private mean. Um, we can't take for granted which which political forms and assemblages are real and public and which are not. Because the modern state is like 
pulling itself out of this world in which there are all sorts of affiliative groups, religious groups, um, companies, and the word company can mean different oh. things, um, local communities, states work in all kinds of motley ways. Um, it's a world in which there are all kinds of groups that I think it's fair to say have some degree of, of sovereignty and sovereignty is, is, a, is a word that I mentioned earlier in this conversation. So I am less interested in, you know, whether, so there's, there's a couple of ways that you could sort of stereotype the founding of the United States. And one is that it's this moment where this new public project gets created by these people who have democracy in mind in this really pure way. Um, and the the other gloomy tack that people take sometimes is the idea that there's this moment of real democratic possibility in the age of the American Revolution. And then the money guys come along and ruin everything, like Robert Morris. Um, and, and all of a sudden we have banking and this moment of democratic possibility has been foreclosed. So we have this sort of morality attached to these concepts of private and public that I don't think are appropriate for a world in which um, sovereignty appears and functions in all different kinds of ways. So I say, you know, look, these organized financial groups, these processes, institutions existed before the United States. Once the United States exists, they're able to pour themselves into these new institutional forms, the joint stock corporations, and they operate from, from there. So the state enables that, and the corporations do helpful things for the state as I talk about in the book, uh, for the federal government, they sort of organize commerce, they do sort of keep merchants in line a, a little bit. Um, they, um, they consolidate wealth domestically and, and uh, British insurers are quite dismayed at how Americans domesticate their insurance very rapidly um, in the first couple of decades after independence. Um, so they use these new forms, these private, quote unquote, joint stock corporations um, to operate within the United States. And, and they do accomplish some pretty significant public political aims. Um, they are helpful to the United States, but they never subsume their desires to accumulate wealth for their founders. And, and we wouldn't necessarily expect them to. They're, they're corporations. That's what they do. Um, and so there are times when the interests of merchants do diverge from the interests of the United States as it is democratically determined or as a state in a less political sense, um, as a, in less partisan sense, I should say. And then they're at odds with the state. So I, I don't see this as a good guy, bad guy story. Um, I see this as a story of institutional reconfiguration in which merchants learn to talk in a new language, um, operating out of their corporations. They learn to reconcile that language with the language of democratic governance. And that's how the United States is. Um, and another example of how this happens in this book, this reconciliation, is that uh, the United States pretty quickly, well, actually not that quickly, but <laughs> with, with, let's say with the, by the 1820s, the United States finds itself in need of its own domesticated understanding of merchant law. Because merchant law, as I should have emphasized earlier, doesn't belong to any particular state. That's why it's often called not a real law, because it's not administered from anywhere. Um, it, some might say that means it's not sovereign. I don't know. But in any case, the United States needs to get a grip on what to do when merchants come into court fighting each other with different versions of merchant law at their disposal, right? You need a United States judge to be able to make some determination. Um, and, you know, one merchant says, well, I followed merchant law this way. The other merchant said I did this way. You know, there's no U.S. judicial precedent. They're trying to use common law, but they're not sure how to use it. Right? Law's a mess in the early U.S. Republic, and that is going to be the subject of my next book. But <laughs> 
who do early American judges go to when they're trying to understand merchant law and to determine which version of merchant law to implement when they run their courts? They tend to go to insurers. They tend to go to the most expert um, American insurers because they see insurers as the people who most understand the principles by which merchant law operates. They're not trying to upset the apple cart. They're not trying to make merchants behave in some totally different way because that doesn't make sense. Merchants have international commitments. They do business with each other. Um, the laws of merchants in some sense are not killable. They're going to continue, but they are going to increasingly be exercised through the courts of the United States. Who's going to tell them how to do that? Insurance company presidents and insurance lawyers. So one of the things I actually mentioned in this book, although I'm not, I don't go so much into detail about the people, uh, but Alexander Hamilton and Daniel Webster are both highly involved in insurance law. It is you know, because insurance is such big business in early American port cities, it's a line of lawyering that makes early U.S. lawyers quite wealthy. Um, and so it, it, it's a line of law that early American lawyers become quite interested in quite early, because that's another business that exists um, before the country and continues on is lawyering. We'll, we'll, stay, we'll, we'll stay away from the lawyers for now. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think what, what's, what's great about your response, I think you, you, you bring together two, two threads. One is the informational role of these insurers because of what you said earlier that they need to understand, you know, you know, that it's hurricane season or that there's a war going on or there's some pirates hanging out in this area there. So they have this enormous information at their disposal, which the state needs. And it's a way in which that information becomes absorbed uh, into state practices uh, through the private area. And the other is just the legal system where the legal system of the United States extracts this, these mercantile practices and embeds it in the law, but the origins are outside of this kind of political system there, which I think are two great points. That's beautifully put, thank you. <laughs> you can write the next book. <laughs> well, I, I, that's, thank you, but that's, that's what I saw. But there's, a, there's a, a point we haven't touched on, which we have to talk about, which is slavery and the slave trade. So tell me about the connection with slavery. Uh, All right. Slave trade, domestic slave trade, insurance, and there's a, there's a lot of great research being done. And, you know, Sharon Murphy has a new book out about banking in the South, uh, which talks about the insuring of slaves and the importance of slaves as a source of capital. So how does that play into your into your into, into this book? Not the next book, but this book. Sure. Well, I should say that I do have a an offshoot article coming out in Slavery and Abolition in June with <laughs> that that followed some of these threads that that didn't really fit in the argument of this book, but it seemed important to pursue. Um, well, you can develop those two if you want. Go ahead. All right. Well, yes, they're kind of mixed together in my mind. Sure. Uh, essentially, um, as a number of historians of slavery and of insurance have determined, um, there are a lot of ways in which slaves are not an exceptional cargo in the 18th century. They're absolutely treated as a form of cargo that can be insured. Now, slave trading is a high risk form of commerce because uh, of the risk of rebellion, because of the risk of, of death, loss, murder, illness. Um, as we know, the mortality rate of enslaved people is very high when they're being um, transported to the Americas, uh, but nonetheless, they're a high value cargo and it is a high value line of business. So there is a great deal of underwriting of the slave trade um, that happens through, uh, not just through Lloyds of London in Britain, but also through um, other British ports like like Liverpool, where there are a number of syndicates that are involved in slave trading and that insure each other. And of course, the French and Spanish have their own uh, underwriters as well for their own slave trades. Now, at the time of US independence, as many scholars have written, there is this sort of surge of antipathy toward slavery um, that particularly takes hold in the North. And so some of the first US insurance companies, um, some sorry, some of the the um, yes, the, some of the first US insurance companies founded in the North specifically say they will not uh, underwrite slave trading. There is sort of this hovering question of the U.S. banning the importation of slaves in 1808, as it uh, as as is eventually the case. So there, there never becomes a mass 
business of slave trade underwriting in the United States the way that there was in Britain. That said, there is plenty of evidence that slave trade underwriting does take place in the United States. Now, it's, it's, it's never banned on a federal level. Some states ban slave trade underwriting for citizens of their states. Massachusetts does, Connecticut does. Um, and after the bans of uh, after the bans are put in place on U.S. involvement in slave trading, uh, it, that is generally legally taken to assume the banning of underwriting of those ships as well, but it's never spelled out. Uh, and, and so there remains this giant loophole, I argue, which is um, Americans underwriting foreign flagged vessels that are involved in slave trading. Now, this is this is why there are Americans involved in slave trading in the first place and some great historians have done work on the late american slave trade recently and these late slave traders are also finding underwriters um, and so once you have abolitionist institutions like the african institution in britain that's sort of like look, looking over the shoulders of the british admiralty as it intercepts um, slave ships um, sometimes they find incriminating correspondence that shows that a quiet slave trade underwriting is happening in a number of American cities, even after this is supposed to be illegal. Um, but it's really after slave trade underwriting enters this legal gray area, which is an area in which underwriters are traditionally quite comfortable. Again, because of their their business's flexibility, its, its ability to be practiced um, and adjudicated through multiple different jurisdictions, outside of formal jurisdictions, through arbitration. There's all kinds of quiet deals going on. Uh, and so there is significant evidence that some Americans do continue to underwrite the, the slave trade. So it's there. It's there. It's there. Yeah, well into the 19th century. And at that point, the slave trade becomes so internationalized and so complicated. Uh, there seems to be evidence that... that, that um, more formal insurance is being done through like corporations based in Brazil and Cuba, right, places where the slave trade is, is legal. But Americans are facilitating that, some American money is involved in that. It's not huge, but it's also not as, as secret as you would think. And the documentary has been dis record has been distorted on this, not only because it's kind of illegal and very immoral, but also because um, corporate U.S. corporations tend to keep their noses clean, cleaner than private underwriters and brokers whose paperwork is is more dispersed and tends to be destroyed. So there's a systematic archival problem in um, uncovering the history of the insurance of the late and illegal American slave trade, but it, it certainly happened. Well, this takes us to the to the 1820s. So let's close out the book. Um, you want to say after the decline of these these wars, the Napoleonic Wars, which really go from the French Revolution through the War of 1812, really maybe 1819, um, that marine underwriting becomes less important to the U.S. financial system, becomes less exceptional, and sort of and again, my read of what you say is that it kind of merges into the emergence of capital institutions, capital-based institutions in the United States. So take us out of that, out of, that, out of how the book sort of closes. How you bring how you, you bring I won't say you bring the curtain down, but how you you, you bring to it to an end the kind of argument you're making about about underwriters. Right. So I would say that my my arc ends when marina underwriting becomes less central to U.S. politics, when it becomes less central to high risk, high reward U.S. commerce. It becomes less. Um, central to the world of political uncertainty in which great um, capital accumulations can be made. So after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, again, U.S. US commercial trade becomes more secure. Underwriting continues. U.S. insurance companies continue to function. There are some bubbles and busts um, starting pretty early. Uh, again, not the Napoleonic Wars, really, but the period after. Um, insurers often tend to struggle in the aftermath of wars because they can no longer charge wartime high premiums, but they do have to pay out on wartime losses. Uh -huh. So the industry sort of hits this dip. Um, the British rush back in with their own ships and their own insurance. And that that mercantile world sort of settles down. And that that was kind of a hard story to describe um, because it's it's a sort of a 
you know, it's not the end of marine insurance, but it's the end of a kind of action that belongs in the age of revolution. And that the, the way that I sort of figured out to try to tell this story was to follow just one guy who's um, a political risk taker. He's a, a sort of a underwriter of the War of 1812. His name is Jacob Barker. He fancies himself a, a Robert Morris of the War of 1812. He's much less successful than than Morris and sort of ends up disgraced. Well, I suppose Morris ends up disgraced too, but a little later in his life. Um, but Barker is sort of this guy with these high risk, high reward inclinations. And so he's like thinking about, well, what do I do after the Napoleonic Wars ends? He's got his hand in a bunch of different pots. Um, and so one pot that he continues to have his hand in is trade to Latin America, where revolutions are still going on. So there's still this sort of revolutionary era commerce where you can charge high premiums, you might get high high payouts. Um, there might be big losses. So he stays in that world a, a little bit. Um, and he also gets involved in some like financially high-flying, questionable corporation founding activities in New York City, um, where he eventually gets in trouble. He sort of pyramids these corporations on top of each other, you know, borrows from one to start the next in this like classic bubble fashion. Then his bubble pops. It looks terrible, but they kind of can't figure out what to charge him with, you know, as in financial crises today, it's not always clear what what the crime is. So the lack of, of US law kind of kind of helps him there. Uh, meanwhile, most of the world of ocean commerce is is calming down. And another place that that high rollers are going is is west and toward investment speculation in the lands that drain to the Mississippi in the rapidly expanding cotton south um, and in places like that. And then the real last piece of the story in the book is why do we not know this story? Which is, I, I, I even think this is kind of a funny question when I say it out loud. Why don't we know more about insurance in the founding era? Why isn't this part of our founding <laughs> national story? And, and again, our laughter reveals why the story sort of tells itself. It doesn't make sense to us that um, an age, a revolutionary project that's characterized for us by this commitment to independence, to democracy, um, it, it doesn't make sense to us to think about um, guys doing this work with an eye on the bottom line, but it is also absolutely true. Um, the American Revolutionary Project needed resources of all kinds. The U.S. as a post-colonial state needed international confidence. It needed merchants with with money. I don't think that makes me somebody who's against democracy to say that, you know, if you don't have the trust of the money guys, you're going to have a lot um, more difficult time setting up a new country, especially a country that's still in, in you know, running a deficit that's in need of foreign investment um, that has not yet secured its borders or um, made its settlers safe from the Indians they're trying to ethnically cleanse off their own lands. Um, none of these things are really settled. So it, it it makes sense that we don't want to put figures like Jacob Barker in the same frame with our military, naval, um, political leaders of the early republic, um, but they're there all the same. And and one last piece of the story that I would point out is that is by the mid nineteenth century, um, there's a genre of writing that criticizes the sort of pell mell capitalism of that era, um, the Wall Street stories. You know, pe people once American literature gets going, it finds Wall Street and finance quite quite interesting. Um, a good target for condemnation, right? It's very bad when there are bubbles and busts. It's bad when people focus on money at the expense of all else. Um, but I think that one thing that these mid-19th century writers do that's a mistake is that they criticize their own period um, by 
contrasting it to a supposedly more virtuous world of the American founding. You know, and they say, well, yes, merchants used to take risks, but they were risks in the wooden world. They were risks where people had real cargoes at stake and, you know, there was real silver that changed hands instead of all this paper. And I'm like, mm, that's that's just kind of not true. <laughs> it's a world of, of pell mell paper in the late 18th century, too. Uh, it's just that the big risk in that time was partly the risk of the United States itself. And again, this is not to denigrate the importance or the virtue of the United States to say that the United States itself was a, a bet that some people were making. Um, and and the underwriters in the United States were putting money on the United States. They were um, backing it. They were expecting it to succeed. Um, the United States did succeed. And as it succeeded, they took their profits, as any underwriters would do, for better or for worse. That said, I'm, I'm left with the image you, you said earlier of um, everybody in the United States, the formative United States, celebrating the high insurance rates in London, yes. where privateers are bringing down their cargo. Because of course they are not distinguishing between the private, you know, mercantile objectives of the insurers and the development of their country. They're saying this is a good thing to have that happen because the insurance is embedded in a revolutionary context in which it is part of the bet that a lot of Americans are making on the revolution. Uh, yes. Well, well said, Hannah. Well, well, thank you for spending time with us. Um, all of you who've listened to this, um, you should check out the book. Uh, Hannah is also throwing a little little tease in for the next book, which I'm not going to ask her about now, but but <laughs> but we will see more from that too. Uh, so thank you again for a Hagley History Hangout, and we will uh, come back uh, in two weeks with another one of these episodes. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Hang on.